Hello, everyone. I hope everyone's doing all right this evening or wherever you are. Um, so today we're going to be talking a little bit on uh, blockchain technology and how it has uh, benefited our um, economy and uh, just a little bit more on the technology and um, some of the background about it um, and how industries are becoming more and more inclined towards um, accepting the currency and or accepting the technology and applying it um, to our everyday life there. Um, so my name is Austin. Um, I am a, a crypto expert who has been involved in the industry for uh, quite a while. Um, I first, uh, I, I grew up in Idaho, um, you know, in the United States where I lived here for about 10 years um, before I moved to Chicago, Illinois, um, where I resided there for a while. Um, and then I moved back where I am today um, here in Idaho. Um, it's really nice over here. It's a great, uh, great state. You know, I really enjoy it. So um, I first began though with uh, cryptocurrency and um, the interest in the in the background and the in the uh, technicals of it um, about middle of high school. Um, so I was about 17, 16. Um, it pretty much started when I built my first computer in uh, freshman year. Um, Use it may, mainly prim primarily for um, just kind of uh, as a hobby, you know, as you know, games and, and whatnot like that. Um, but I learned when I could um, started seeing on different websites and stuff that I could be uh, making money um, doing, you know, just a little bit of money on the side, um, using it for like mining and stuff like that. So it was something that kind of intrigued me, you know, because being in high school, you know, not having a um, extremely stable job and stuff like that. It was just, you know, it was something I could do. Um, so I, uh, slowly began to spend more time in investing, uh, money and, uh, just my extra time into, uh, researching it and stuff like that. So it was a great, you know, it was a great thing. And it was a really nice segue into what I know today. And, um, yeah, so outside of crypto though, uh, I do have, you know, other hobbies and whatnot. Um, I enjoy anything that's mechanically involved with like a vehicle or, um, I enjoy reading and um, just things like that, you know, keep my brain uh, going and learning. So, um, but as, uh, as I said, this webinar is going to be covering the important aspects of blockchain technology and how it has benefited our ecosystem as a whole. Um, and more industries are becoming more inclined towards using it. Um, a lot more different currencies through businesses and corporations are popping up every day and it's uh, very consistently growing. So what is blockchain technology? It's something that you've heard me say, you know, uh, just a few minutes ago, but it's in, it, it started with the emergence of Bitcoin in 2009. Um, that's where it really gained traction um, as something being more mainstream, you know. Um, it is a system of recording information in a way um, and taking in the transaction taking place, making it more difficult or impossible to change. So in essence, it is a transparent, public, immutable ledger um, in which information can be uh, uh, written, but it cannot be changed. So whatever is written on the blockchain and what is created, it is, um, you cannot alter it afterwards, um, which has a lot of benefits to it, you know, and um, a lot of different applications. Um, so it is famously known, as I said, as a distributed ledger of transactions. Um, it is duplicated and distributed across the network of computer systems on the blockchain. And um, so each block in the chain contains a number of transactions. Um, and every time a new transaction occurs, a record of that transaction is added to every participant's ledger. Um, and that's where when it is added, it cannot be changed. Um, so this is known as a DLT or distributed ledger technology um, and blockchain is just a type of DLT in which the transactions are recorded and it which is an immutable cryptographic signature which is also known as a hash so you'll hear the term immutable come up um, here soon and we can explain more of that so some of the properties of the DLT or the distributed ledger technology is it is extremely private so since it lacks any sort of intermediary um, like banks PayPal or Visa um, there's no need to rely on them to facilitate the uh, transfer of the monetary transactions. Um, so it, it's taking out that middleman that 
we use with cards or we use with the different services that you can download and stuff like that, um, such as PayPal, uh, Visa, you know, et cetera. Um, the digital freedom. Um, so with blockchain being decentralized, um, a term which we will get into here, here soon, um, there's no one company controlling the stored information um, or modifying how they operate. Um, so this has a lot of benefits because again, it is, um, it's all completely geared with the users um, directly, you know, instead of a company or something. So immutable, this is what I mentioned earlier. Um, all that means it is a super simply put, it is uh, all the information that is stored is permanent and unable to be changed or modified. Um, so that's where um, the term, you know, for, uh, um, what we spoke about earlier um, with the black, um, <laughs> with the blockchain, sorry about that. Um, with the blockchain technology and stuff like that, it being immutable, it has um, a lot of benefits to it, um, of it not being able to be changed or modified. So you won't have uh, one any person, um, you know, messing around with it and stuff like that. So the low transaction fees, this is uh, certainly more uh, prevalent when referring to transferring high amounts of money or transferring in between countries, um, sending money and receiving um, as you know, sometimes when you send funds over um, an app or th transfer through a bank, um, there's fees and uh, even sometimes time holds associated with it. Sometimes you send the money and they won't receive it. The recipient won't um, be able to re re receive it until even a few minutes afterwards, um, which is normal. But um, with uh, the di distributed ledger technology, it allows us to send money even upwards of uh, millions of dollars. Um, for a very, very low cost, um, which has everyone, you know, enjoy saving money. So there's a, there's a big benefit for a lot of people if you're transferring between companies or sending privately. Um, and it is very secure, um, which is one of the big um, benefits that a lot of people um, see in it. It is, um, since, it's, uh, since they're made of nearly hundreds of thousands of nodes, um, there's no one way to pinpoint or um, directly find um, uh, the, to um, attack or steal money from somebody, you know, with a computer. Uh, the, the different computers all act as, it's like a grid. Um, so it's all completely, you know, separated and whatnot. Um, and anonymous, um, basically it goes in tandem with the privacy um, so since cryptocurrency is based on top of uh, blockchain technology, it gives the users uh, the capability to carry out the transactions without the need for the third party um, intermediary. So it goes in tandem with the privacy and um, it, it allows you to, you won't need your name, you don't need you know, a picture of yourself, some uh, services require identification, you know, and stuff like that. But uh, with DLTs, you don't need to have that. So how the blockchain technology works and um, to put it super simply, so a transaction is requested, um, you know, you ask someone for the money and the transaction is then broadcasted to a peer to peer network, which will is another term we will get into uh, shortly. Uh, that consists of computers, also known as nodes, which we will refer to them as um, the network of computers or nodes um, use known algorithms to verify validate and um, authenticate the transaction and the user status. Um, so once that um, transaction is requested, it immediately goes through to one of the um, networks and then um, it's validated. So once it's verified and it can be cryptocurrency contracts or uh, records or any other information, um, the transaction is then combined with another transaction. And once those are verified, um, it creates a new block of data for the ledger. So that new block is added um, to the existing blockchain, which is again, permanent and unalterable. So once that is, is done, it's impossible to change. And then the transaction is finished. So it's um, a lot quicker than uh, some traditional banks and, and stuff like that. But um, again, you, the benefits of it are uh, enormous. So we'll go ahead and continue here. So digitizing uh, an asset on the blockchain. So digit, uh, digitization of assets uh, is a process in which the rights to an asset are converted um, into a digital token on a blockchain. 
um, such as Bitcoin or, you know, a lot of different coins out there. Um, the ownership rights are transmitted uh, and traded on the digital platform, and therefore the real world assets on the blockchain are represented by the digital tokens. Um, so the blockchain plays a very, very important um, vital role in making it possible to maneuver towards a dis digitization of uh, physical assets because um, it being transparent and distributed uh, alongside the nature of it being uh, audible and immutable. And converting a physical asset into, a, into the tradable digital asset can unlock a whole lot of potential uh, in real world assets and making it possible for his or her exchange in real time. So the, platform, the blockchain platform is capable to uh, supply a better degree of liquidity. So the tangible and intangible assets, um, some people might have some skepticism because, um, you know, with uh, cryptocurrency, especially, you know, it's not something that, you know, you can hold. It's not like having cash in your, uh, in your wallet that you can take, you know, out and uh, manipulate. But um, they have physical ex uh, existence. Um, they, but with that, they can be depreciated. Um, so, you know, you have money, and if you were to lose that wallet, you know, your your wallet or you know, money was to get lost somehow. Um, there's no getting that back. But um, it's easier to liquidate, especially due to their physical existence. So you hear that with um, coins and with um, you know, uh, money that's lost or stolen. Um, and the cost can be easily determined from that. So um, some of the examples, you know, vehicles, plant machinery, et cetera. Um, and they do not have, so with the intangible, they don't have a physical existence. So it is in essence, virtually on, you know, on the, uh, the platform that you're using and they are um, amortized, which just means that no matter what happens, whether you're there to uh, receive those funds or not, those funds do exist and they will always be there. Um, so they're not as easy to uh, liquidate and sell in the market. Um, you can't just, you know, pull a lot of, um, there's just a lot of money and um, the cryptocurrency, you can't really just liquidate it. You know what I mean? It has to go somebody, somewhere. So the cost, the cost is a lot, um, a lot harder to determine um, with it being um changing every day you know what i mean for example the us dollar wherever you go you'll be able to buy something with that but with this it's always changing um so software logo patents etc those are some of the things that that change value over time especially um, more dramatically so here's a good illustration of a centralized um, versus a peer-to-peer -peer network which was what we discussed earlier um, the centralized basically think of it as a branch where um, you request a transaction or you request a fund transfer and you go from the first user and then it goes to the center um, or we can just say as like a bank it's that uh, is then requested from the bank and then sent to the next user whereas a peer-to-peer -peer takes out that third party bank uh, paypal etc and it's directly in between all of the users um, so it's a lot quicker and you don't have the um, privacy issues of having a, a bank or a service um, uh, recording your transactions and stuff like that. Um, so it's a lot more secure. Yeah, so as here, a centralized system, the administrators are responsible for all data recovery and backups, which means the central organization structures rely on one individual um, to make the decisions and provide the direction for that company. So with any company, there's always gonna be the top guy up there um, that decides where and how he wants that uh, company to go. Um, while in peer-to-peer -peer systems, each node requires its own backup um, backup system, and the peer-to-peer -peer system is never purely centralized, is, is never pure centralized. So represented by the traditional client-server architecture, which we saw back here. Um, so yeah, as a peer-to-peer -peer system is a decentralized platform whereby two individuals interact directly without each other. Um, and without intermission by the third party. Instead, it is the buyer and the seller directly um, with each other through that service. So in any distributed system, such as a P2P network, um, there's usually trade-offs that can be done in terms of efficiency, security, scalability, et cetera. Um, and the decentralization and robustness of those you know, vary. But in terms of scalability, decentralized approaches have a bigger potential um, because 
but it's not trivial to ensure that a given decentralized system actually scales well from both the theoretical and practical point of view. Um, so it basically is saying that if um, it, it's up to everybody how that system decides to work, you know what I mean? So I'm going to go here. So a lot of people have um, skepticism and they're very cautious when it comes to learning about cryptocurrency and blockchain technology because it is very new. Uh, well, it's relatively new to us. You know, it's not as common as a lot of the, any sort of other um, currency. So everyone wants to be very educated. And especially when it comes to money, you want to understand what you're you know, getting yourself into and what the benefits and the pros and the cons are going to be. So um, while it does hold promise for reinventing uh, the business process, it is a developing technology um, with a few production systems in place. And we know that blockchain is often touted as a uh, world changing technology. Um, you hear, you know, you, if you see, read the news on any um, trading website and stuff like that, it is consistently talking about how um, you know, oh, this is going to be the next big thing. You know, you, you see some of the news with um, the different currencies and stuff, how they just go up so much in price and people make a lot of money and stuff like that. Um, but those typically are more favored and biased towards the positives. Um, but we do need to um, address the negatives um, for it to be a good, um, good understanding of, you know, uh, what you're going to be getting yourself into. So the cost and efficiency, um, the speed and the effectiveness um, with which blockchain networks can execute those peer-to-peer -peer transactions comes at a very high ag aggregate cost. Um, so which is greater for some types of, um, types of blockchain than others. So the decisions about implementing the blockchain um, applications really need to be thought through um, and analyzed before um, they're completely implemented. Um, the returns to an individual processing nodes, um, either individuals in a public blockchain or organizations in a sector-wide blockchain, um, whether it be a group of computers or just you know having a single computer like some people here uh, in a call would have. So that may diminish as the network size grows, um, which you know, as, as time goes on, you know, there may be a bigger influx of people uh, deciding to adapt to it or there, it might fall off. So um, the awareness and understanding part of it, the lack of awareness of the technology, again, as we spoke, is it's very new, um, especially in areas like banking um, and people investing their money. It's a, a widespread lack of understanding of how it works. Um, is the main, it's, it's typically the main challenge for a lot of people and um, kind of the deciding factor on its, and, and its widespread adoption. It's a very uncertain thing. And, you know, you see some of the stories in, you know, in the, in the news, even mainstream um, about some cryptocurrencies being worth a lot and they either increase or they just fall off um, over time. And it's, it's an it's uncertain thing, but that's not something that should turn away a lot of people because if you're willing to invest the time and just understanding of it, um, you can definitely see the benefits. So the regulation and the governance of it, um, there's a strong argument against uh, block, well, for the blockchain applications to work with um, existing structures of uh, money and stick data, uh, money and whatnot, but not outside of them. So this means that um, the regulators in all industries um, have to understand that the technology its impact of the businesses and consumers in their sector. Um, so with that, um, a good way to explain that is like how we talked about a benefit earlier of the uh, P2P network, it being between two users. Sometimes you don't have that certainty of that third party intervening in case something happens. So, but the security and privacy, um, this is a, well, it's a uh, two-sided coin, especially I, I would say. Um, a lot of the applications for blockchain require uh, smart transactions and contracts to be indisputably linked to known identities um, and import and raise a lot of questions about privacy and the security of the data and what's going to happen to it and where it goes and the, uh, the accessibility um, on the shared ledger. 
So if you're concerned with, you know, uh, even a lot of people still have concerns about um, even like debit cards and whatnot, where, you know, you get some people where they are nervous to even enter their uh, card information onto some websites and stuff like that. Um, but with this, it's, um, it does require those smart contracts and stuff like that. So it is known linked to those identities and stuff like that. And the increased performance. Um, so blockchain is similar to an accounting ledger. So it only records the transactions um, across a vast network. Uh, oh, well, so it's similar to an accounting ledger, except it records the transactions across a vast network and it's decentralized. So meaning it doesn't require any central authority to oversee it, no banks, none. it's completely uh, uh, recorded um, through the network. So there's no need, there, there, there needs to be a consensus on the network about the validity and the transaction in order to go through. So um, if you want to, as long, if you want to transfer funds to someone to make a transaction, um, you don't even have to like the other person, but everyone needs to agree um, for that transaction to, to take place. Um, so the types of blockchain, um, you, there, it's a term that has a lot of um, meaning outside of crypto as well, but there's the public, the private, and the consortium which are the three, um, the three types. Uh, public blockchain, is, it allows anyone to join the network and it allows um, the transactions to be visible to every network user. Um, so there's a record um, of what occurs. So if, if you see a large move in um, a cryptocurrency, it, you, you'll be able to see that. Um, but there's a no trust relationship among, among the network users before joining the network. Again, like I spoke about, um, the previous slide about it being where you don't even have to know the person um but you just add the entire um the entire ledger needs to agree on that transaction to take place so bitcoin and, and ethereum um belong to the class of public blockchain so you see um if there was a large move in the bitcoin industry and somebody decided to sell off a lot of coins that they own you would you would see that happen and you would have a record of it um, private blockchains, on the other hand, they're contrary to be permission based, which means that they're referred to as permission ledgers um, and can be constructed using a hyperledger fabric, which is hosted by the Linux Foundation. Um, so the digital records that um, can be encrypted and are visible only to authorized users. It's not like a public where um, anyone can see it, but it's only to the people that are authorized to see it. So the privacy requirements um, of the data are fulfilled. Um, the main difference between the public and private is the user verification and authentication mechanism. Um, so in public networks, there's no trust relationship among the network nodes. Um, whereas this, it, you um, with the private blockchain, you want everyone to be familiar with um, each other and have that authentication and uh, verification. And consortium blockchain, it's a um, block, it's a block authentication performed by a set of specific nodes. So it is categorized as a semi-private and permission blockchain. So it's kind of in the middle there um, where it is partially centralized because it needs to be authenticated from specific computers um, or nodes as we spoke about earlier. But the system is controlled by the few uh, selected computers and contrary to the public blockchain, um, which is decentralized and the private blockchain, which is more on the centralized side. Um, so the network nodes have uh, are having authority to can configure the data in blockchain to be public or private. Um, so R3C and Hyperledger are some examples of consortium blockchain networks. Um, so it's, it's again, it's kind of a balance of the both um, where they can choose um, to have the authority to configure the data however they would like and manipulate it. So some of the challenges with uh, blockchain technology and implementing it, um, there's a few things associated where the, the storage requirement um, is a big part of it. Um, it's a very large requ um, requirement as the validation process involves the whole, the whole blockchain. So however big it is, it, it requires the entire um, and, and the entirety of it to be there. So only a few transactions can be performed per second uh, due to fixed block size, uh, which can be increased. Um, and it causes 
the transaction delays and high transaction fee. Uh, but if the block size is increased, um, it will cause additional delay in block propagation. So finding ways to balance that out is, um, is very important. But moreover, it is possible to generate fake blocks as well um, by the network nodes. And, and again, these are some of the challenges that um, many people are facing um, with blockchain and whatnot and um, finding different ways to work around this and whatnot. But um, so it not being often, but it is possible to generate fake blocks um, by the network nodes um, or generate transactions that are reverse confirmed. So rapid generation of blocks um, is possible by the increased power consumption resulting in legitimate blocks not being able to get their, their share of the, the network resources, um, which can be a problem, but um, an important challenge of blockchain um, is, to, is implementing it and finding ways around this. Um, but the applications, um, I think far supersede a lot of the issues, um, and some of the issues that a ha blockchain has, because um, it's only it's not even it's not only benefited cryptocurrency, but many different industries um, that needed to store or manipulate the higher amounts of data. And I think that the uh, the problems that that are associated are certainly the um, exception and not the rule. Um, but blockchain technology has has the potential really to uh, support the field of financial, public, and social services, um, like land record man management, asset management, uh, educational services, energy conservation, uh, citizen registration systems, um, taxation systems. There's all sorts of applications to use it for, and implementing it and can only get better over time because you know with um, different people working on it and new moves in uh, technology and stuff, it it makes it a lot easier and a little more fluid. So some of the industry uh, industries that employ blockchain technology to prove their operations, you know, banking, cybersecurity, um, marketing, advertising, supply chain management, uh, voting and finance. These are all examples of things that have um, employed and implemented um, the blockchain technology because it improves their uh, operations and um, they see the benefit in it, you know, and it's just implementing over time. Um, so here's another uh, on the uh, advantages of blockchain technology. Um, it being a high level of security, um, again, as it requires no intermediary, um, like bank or PayPal, um, it's very secure and it can be, it's with the P2P network, there's a, um, there's keys for your wallet. There's the public key and the private key, um, which is only you, you can write it down on a piece of paper, you can have it on your computer, it's your key, you know, and, and that's for you. Um, whereas it's not like something you can just access um, through like a banking app or go to someone and they'll have your information. So the transparency of the transactions being increased, um, that's a huge benefit because as we said with like public um, ledgers and stuff like that, where you're able to have a record of the um, transactions that have taken place, um, I think that's a it's something everyone can benefit from because they can see um, what has occurred and what trends have happened and stuff. So the automatic reconciliation of accounts, um, simply put, just means that um, the accounts and the and the payment uh, it's all how do I explain? everything is created. Um, automatically for you again with like the public key or the uh, public uh, blockchain where you don't have to create um, your own uh, account information and stuff like that. it's all automatically recorded um, so it is public and it's for everybody to see there um, hacking threat rate being reduced um, you hear some things about some banks or some um, services paypal you know different things that have um, been victims of uh, cyber attacks and stuff like this where or DDoS uh, attacks where people try to um, infiltrate and get into those you know services um, but it being um, the the nature uh, the, the the very nature of a peer-to-peer -peer network um, it's it's reduced greatly um, having security being increased and uh, the hacking threat is reduced 
Um, so no payment uh, for intermediary services, again, like banks or PayPal, as we discussed earlier, um, it being that, that digital freedom, it's, um, there's no need to, to pay someone else um, to send your own money. You know, some services you spend, you send $100 to, a, to another receive, uh, receiving uh, computer and you have to pay $105, for example, um, but there's no need for that. Um, and if there is, it's again, as we discussed about it being a um, like less than $100 to send a very, very large amount of money. Now, uh, the trans faster transactions, as, as it doesn't have to be authorized through a, um, through a bank or through a service, it just has to be authenticated through the blockchain. Um, the transactions occur a lot quicker. And the different levels of accessibility, um, this is more of, uh, related to the different style, kinds of blockchain that can be implemented, um, where some people can uh, just put a little money into it, you know, and they and they have it, just let it sit, you know, and they have it in their in their uh, crypto wallet or something, or you can be someone who implements it for an entire business. Again, as we said, voting um, in the previous slides, voting, uh, accounting, uh, all sorts of different uh, examples for that. Uh, so the future directions um, for the blockchain technology, it's at its uh, nascent stage, and it is anticipated that the enterprises will continue to extend their IT systems with blockchain-based uh, systems. As we said earlier, so a lot of places and banks have already implemented it um, into their services, and um, they are receiving the benefits every day with it. Um, and they're based the systems so that they test the functionality and uh, upgrade the internal business processes and uh, model subsequently. So when um, other everyone benefits when new technology comes out for blockchain, um, because it is easy. It's something that everyone can implement. So it will take time though um, for the industry to really appreciate and I think um, fully understand and have a grasp on the technology. Um, and the value that it could bring to an organization. You know, a lot of people who have implemented early on have been relying on it and using it and, and loving it, you know, um, because it is something that's so, um, it's just easy to adapt, you know what I mean? So um, uh, the uh, before the core uh, IT functions are completely transferred to the technology, that's where it could, you know, have the value that it brings. Um, and really appreciate the benefits. So blockchain techno uh, technology has the potential to really drive big changes and opportunities for different industries. Um, so blockchain uses technologies like the distributed consensus mechanism, um, cryptographic hash, et cetera, where um, those key strengths of the technology are that um, the records are reliable, persistent, and audible, as we said with um, blockchain being just a transparent, public, immutable ledger. Um, it's anonymous, it's decentralized, you know, it's everything a lot of people want. You know, you want something that's reliable, but also consistent. Um, and blockchain really has a diverse uh, number of applications to, for, for this. Um, you know, having a anonymous um, voting type of blockchain or having something that is, you know, audible um, reliable, especially, but, um, online payments, digital assets, um, smart contracts, um, security, financial services can all, um, uh, really benefit from these. So in a, um, here in a tech, tech Republic study, uh, research study, uh, 64% of professionals said that they expect blockchain to affect their industry in some way. And most of them see, foresee a positive result. And that's completely, you know, those are the people that have really um, looked into it and, and understand the fundamentals and the principles of it. So a recent trend um, insight report from the analyst uh, from Gartner uh, made the following forecast of it being through tw uh, 2020, um, only 10% of uh, enterprises will achieve any uh, radical transformation by using blockchain. Um, and by 2022, at least one innovative business built on blockchain will be worth 10 billion, um, which is up for a business to be built on that sort of technology being worth so much is, is huge. 
um, because it's again so being so newfound and being a um, a fresh new uh, way of implementing these things. It's uh, having a ten billion dollar uh, business would be very uh, make it in the mainstream for sure. Um, by 2026, uh, the business value added by blockchain will grow over 360 billion and uh, four years later to grow more than 3.1 trillion. So it's over time, it's just gonna completely increase and in, uh, vamp up in, in usage and in value and in uh, applicability there. So thank you guys so much for um, tuning in. Um, I really hope this is able to benefit you um, in some way with understanding um, some of the technology and the um, applications for blockchain, as it is such an, a, um, it's, it's a new concept for a lot of people. Um, so they're looking for ways to educate themselves and understand, you know, um, what the benefits and the pros and the cons are going to be. Um, this is um, certainly something that we're going to build on and we're going to continue to um, inform and educate um, as a lot of people, you know, they, they would like to implement this with their own business or they would like to invest money. Um, this is something that is very important. And I think that we're going to have a, um, good time explaining. So thank you guys so much. Um, we will see you next time, uh, next week about the same time. Thank you guys.